Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Grohl has decided to make sure my holiday season goes right by releasing a brand new Foo Fighters album. After spending their last album in Dave Grohl's house, recording in his garage, this album is a return to the studio setup. And not just any studio, but studios outside of the Foo Fighters headquarters of 606. That one simple transition has led to an album that feels almost ultra real in its sense of smoothness. While Dave and the guys with Wasting Light were very focused on giving us a gritty type of record, Sonic Highways lands on the complete opposite end of the production spectrum. The sounds are smooth like glass. Closer to 1997's The Color and the Shape, this record contains some of the most produced sounding tracks the band has ever released. Dave Grohl has made himself the spokesman of do-it-yourself rock and roll. So you'd imagine the Foo Fighters as a band that would be afraid of having the word produced be used to describe a track of theirs or a record of theirs. But the word to fear is overproduced, and that this record is not. So hats off to Butch Vig and the fantastic Foo Fighters. This is the shortest record the Foo Fighters have ever made, and given that it's eight tracks, I can actually go through it song by song. So. Let's get going. All right, first song on the record, Something From Nothing. I'm gonna start this off with my most unenthusiastic comment of this review, and that is that, for me, Something From Nothing should have been somewhere else in the track list order, even right after the beginning, but just not the beginning song. It just doesn't strike me as an album opener in the same way that All My Life, or In Your Honor, or Bridge Burning clearly were. With the exception of The Color and the Shapes Doll, a song which I don't really consider to be an album opener anyway, to me it's much more of like a prelude. Because it ties into the lyrics in the last song on the album in a way that makes it a nice whole story. Anyway, the Foos have a habit of kicking off their albums with songs that immediately pull you in, and that's something that eluded me with Something From Nothing. While I did find plenty to like about the song, you know, the vocals were really catchy to me in the verses, Chris Shiflett's sliding guitar it gives a really cool, almost eerie vibe to the buildup that later incorporates a funky Moog riff on the keys, which is an addition that reminded me a lot of John Paul Jones's work with them, Crooked Vultures. But with all those cool things in it, the song, just for whatever reason, still didn't grab me and pull me in. I can't help but think that my reaction to the song may have been better had it been second or third instead of being used as the gunshot to launch us into the whole record. But the good thing I can say about my lukewarm reaction to the beginning whole buildup of the song is that it made the final half of it all the sweeter. As soon as I heard Dave's howl explode into the song, it just, it, it felt like a release I had been waiting for since the very beginning, and that was very gratifying. Interestingly enough, in a way that I don't know if it would have been had the whole song been catchy from the beginning. I don't know why, it just didn't feel right to me. But it did feel right to the Foos, and I guess that is what matters, cause it's kind of their record. Song number two, The Feast and the Famine. This is the song that, as far as I'm concerned, should have opened up the record. And there's a song in this record that is quintessential foo. It is The Feast and the Famine. There is somebody blowing their leaves right now outside my house during the review. I suppose it's better than if they were blowing people. That would be far more distracting. The interesting stop-start pattern, the, the sense of like brutal attack, and the explosion that is that battering ram of a chorus. It is delicious. I particularly like the song because it has a sense about it that it reminds of their B-sides. I love their B-sides. Walking the Line, or even that song they did for Orange County, The One. The One is a... It's a good song. And for me, this song sounds like it could have been one of the Foo's more aggressive B-sides. It is a badass track. It's a f***ing ride. Probably my favorite song on this record. It has all the positive qualities usually associated with the band. It's loud, punchy, and direct. And we move on to the third song on the record. Congregation. I don't have much to say about Congregation. It's another good song on the record. It's catchy. It marks the last song on the record that you can really associate clearly with their past album work. It sounds like it plays in a universe that could exist within Echoes, Silence, Patience, and Grace. Like, it plays between Long Road to Ruin and Cheer Up Boys, Your Makeup is Running. I like the entire song. Again, it's catchy, but the bridge absolutely steals the show on this song. The bridge is a shift in tone and aggression and just listen to it. Song numero cuatro on this record. What did I do slash God is my witness. From this point on, the band takes a shift on this album, and they do something that confused me, but with pleasant results. I read in an interview with Dave Grohl that he was planning on bringing in a bunch of different influences and uh, you know musicians to sit in from all the cities they were visiting while making this record. But they were doing this while consciously making sure to keep that thing that gives the Foo Fighters their sound. 
I don't think that was achieved, but even if their goal to keep, you know, their core sound intact or whatever was achieved or not, I don't care because the songs that we're left with are tasty anyway. And What Did I Do Slash God Is My Witness is the first example of that. The first half is a rollicking three minutes of old school rock and roll mixed with a dash of classic rock and a Scarface worthy amount of cocaine. It's like if a Little Richard song had a baby with Sweet Home Alabama and then they realized, holy we are a dysfunctional family, and they put it up for adoption where it was later adopted by the 80s. That's what it's like. I say the 80s because if I were to give a headline to the second half of the album, it would be Step aside, Journey. The Foos are back with their own rockin' power ballad. God Is My Witness is a piece of music that would make 80s Aerosmith cream their pants while simultaneously weeping, because it is that beautiful. And messy. This is an aspect of the song that struck me strongly because it gave the impression that the Foos with this record are more kind of playing around with a sense of genre almost. It feels like they're dipping their feet in different eras of rock. Now we are at Outside, song number five. This song to me is Taylor Hawkins and Nate Mendel's song. His bass line is popping and prominent. I don't feel like I've gotten to hear it that way in many recordings before this. I have a sneaking suspicion that Taylor Hawkins had more a hand in writing this than Dave. It just sounds like something that could have been on Taylor's other band's albums, The Coattail Riders. It has more of that flavor. The riffs, the arpeggios, the, the note choices themselves. It's very reminiscent of Taylor Hawkins' taste. And when I read that Joe Walsh, associated with the Eagles, took a part in this track, it kind of really justified my theory to me. The known fact that Taylor Hawkins is a big fan of classic rock, of the police and the Eagles and everything from that era, and that this song has that flavor to it that once you realize Joe Walsh is there, you kind of go, okay, yeah, it's kind of Eagle-ish. That's, I mean, I don't, it might have all been Dave, but I think it was Taylor Hawkins. That Dr. Watson is my theory. And I can't leave this track without mentioning something that is a huge delight for me in this record and it's within this song and within subterranean and that's that they incorporate these kind of very uh, nuanced breakdowns it's not something we've had before in a foo fighters record for the foos it had been a thing they mainly did live but now they incorporate it into their record and it gives a whole other thing to it that is really really just entertaining. And it's something you don't hear many famous modern bands doing on their tracks honestly because it's just not ADD listener friendly. Songs, as far as I'm concerned, need to be catchy in some way and I love a good hook. But I also don't think that it's something that every single rock song needs to completely revolve around from beginning to end. There should be a little bit of experimentation, a little bit of, of room to breathe and bring in new things. And that portion is why Outside is one of my favorite tracks on this record. In the clear, horns are so new to the foos that when you first listen to this song you're gonna think your brain fell through a black hole and landed in a killer's album. There are parts in the verses that almost feel empty, with just palm muted guitar chucking over drum and bass. Interestingly enough, I ended up really appreciating that restraint that led to the drums and bass being the majority of the sound in those verses. Those producers and bands can often get songs to a point where it feels like every possible little pocket of space has been filled with a riff or a note or an effect or whatever, and this is one of those songs where I, you know, realized there's little pockets where they could have put something in there, but they chose to hang back. And that's what's making it stand out right now. That's what's drawing my attention to it. One of my favorite songs on the record, melody-wise, it's a feel-good song and something I can see the Foo Fighters playing with Bruce Springsteen. Song number seven, Subterranean. When the song first began, I'm gonna say that I didn't feel it as a melody that I enjoyed. But after letting the song play out, Subterranean really grew on me. Once the whole band dropped into the song, it really came alive for me and I was able to appreciate what it had to offer. A detailed, multi-layered production carrying a vibe that was brought on by those notes at the beginning I really didn't think I enjoyed. Because what they do is provide a kind of emotional dissonance. It makes you feel two things at once. You, know, you feel an eerie sense of displacement, but right with that is a feeling of wonder. So, the two biggest aspects of dreaming. And I now value it as another sonic shift in a short but variety-fueled album. This is a floaty, atmospheric song. Maybe Bowie-esque? Little bit of David Bowie sprinkled on there? I can clearly imagine David Bowie singing on the song. Subterranean This is ground control to Major Tom I'm going to do the rest of this vlog as David Bowie. This is the other song that tries doing that delicious breakdown that I love so much. Once again, awesome to hear on this track. This is a very production-centric song. 
Again, not overproduced, just, just using production's positive qualities to the max. The production of this record is really different. One of the big things is, you know, while in the last album everything seemed to be cranked to 10, we come back to a set of dynamics where the drums aren't as loud as they can be in the mix. They're a little bit more subdued within the sound and it, it all kind of correlates to create an atmosphere, which, awesome job, peoples of the band. We arrive at the final and album closing track of Sonic Highways, I Am A River. The CW has a new anthem in I Am A River. With a deliberately slow build that clearly shows it's the end song on the album and won't allow it to fit anywhere else. Again, in relation to what I said about the album's opener, the Foos have a habit of concluding their albums with their most adventurous track, songwriting-wise, last. And in this case, they did not deviate from that. However, I Am A River is something new for the Foos in that it's the most modern pop rock sounding track that they have ever recorded. And it's hilarious because I actually like the song a lot. And the production on it just lends it this tone that is absolutely perfect for laying over season finales of teen dramas. It's just made for that. If you are a Hollywood producer with a hit teen drama on television and you are not at this moment calling Dave Grohl for the rights to use the chorus from I Am A River over your season finale, you should be fired because there is nothing more obvious than bringing those two lovebirds together. If you watch drama on television, particularly like high school or family drama, I guarantee you, you're gonna be hearing this chorus over your favorite TV show in about two weeks, if not all your favorite TV shows. Now, as for how I feel about the actual music, I like the melody and I just, for whatever reason, wish that the pre-chorus that's there before the first chorus wasn't there. I wish they hadn't had that in the song because it leaves me feeling like that guy in the club who's like signaling the beats about to drop and he's just ready for it. Here it comes and oh no, it keeps going for another few seconds. I'm not sure what's happening. I'm pretty sure the point of including it was just to have as much kind of flowy variety within that one song as possible. So they wanted to have a pre-chorus that then wouldn't play the second time around. So there's, you know, a sense of change and that often keeps things energized. And especially for a six, seven minute long song, there is always that danger of like, okay, we're going on a long journey here, folks. Don't get bored. You know, they might've wanted to shake it up a bit. In this case, with a chorus this catchy, I really just kind of wanted to get there. I just wanted the beat to drop when I thought it would and just <laughs> It doesn't look the same when I do it instead of Emma Watson. And so we've reached the end of this review. Listen to the record with earphones if you can. I can't recommend that enough. I hope you enjoy it when you do. They are one of my favorite bands, if not my favorite band, and they have a great album out in stores right now. Leave some comments in the area below. I wanna hear your thoughts, cause the voices in my head talk enough as it is. Hasta la bye bye. Under pressure. Under